Hi, Sue. Hi, Janet. How are you? Good. It's still pretty warm. I know. It's 80. I just ran around and looked at the temperature. It's 87 outside and 78 inside. <laughs> I have to move my <clears throat> computer all around when um, when we do this because um, the illumination is really bad. So where you know on my face where I normally sit, so I end up having to do this giant reconfig of how I how I lift how I have my computer. Hi, Dasuki. Oh. Hello. Hello. Hi, Janet. Ah, it's a nice day. 70, mm -hmm. 87 outside, 78 inside. <laughs> Hot. How, how, what, 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 what would it be? Um, so you're from Osaka, would it be pretty, I mean, do you even remember how hot it was? <laughs> you don't want to go there in summer. <laughs> Just too hot. Yeah, the temperature is okay, probably 75 to 85. However, the problem is the humidity. You know, Japan is such a small island. So in summertime, unless you hit the coastline, the humidity is usually like a 95 or 100 oh, percent. It's just like Atlanta in summer, so it's just yeah. really difficult to breathe. Yeah. I used I used to call Atlanta Hot Lanta. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Crazy. Oh no. Yeah, you could. Uh, when I lived there, I remember planting pansies, which is small, you know, small flower. Um, you plant them in the fall, they grow all winter long, and then in the summer it gets too hot for them and they all die and you have to plant something <laughs> more heat tolerant. Here, I was kind of surprised. I planted, um, I like planting pansies. They, my, my grandmother always mm. used to have them. Uh, and the, um, so I, I planted them, right? They, and then the snow came and buried them, completely buried, under six, eight feet of snow. I mean, just a ton of snow and, uh, and then in the spring, they were still alive. They didn't mm -hmm. get killed because it never got cold enough to really kill them <laughs> underneath all that snow. I was shocked. Yeah. It was kind of interesting, yeah. We started planting a lot of veggies in the backyard this, this summer. So yeah, tomatoes, cucumbers, they are growing very fast. That's good. Do you, yeah. have, do you have deer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you put up a, a small deer fence? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, my wife did it actually. So that, yeah. yeah, and the squirrels also, you know, they try to eat something, right? Yeah, yeah. we have a rabbit and a skunk. <laughs> By the way, can you hear me clearly? I tried, I'm using this earphone now, so. Actually, it's, it's really good. It's really okay. good. Okay. It's good nice, nice and crisp. You'll probably, when you're teaching this fall, you'll probably want to use that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the department um, it will buy you a headset if you want. Just ask your department. Mm -hmm. You know, like a. I like wearing a headset because I actually feel like I can hear better than my computer um, speakers. And um, I don't think the microphone works, though. I think I think the computer microphone is picking me up, but. Mm -hmm. um, the audio in my ear is actually far better than the audio I can get out of the computer. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and you have the final set of slides? I do. I Good. received it from uh, Brian. Good. Yep. Very good. So, yep. Yeah, we've been doing this almost weekly that one one monday was memorial day i think and so we didn't do that monday but um and we're going to skip this monday this coming monday mm -hmm. because it's um 
going to be the July 4th holiday time frame. At least I think we are. Our next one isn't till July 10th or so, right? Better look that up. Do you know how many people signed in this time? We won't know until it gets started. Um, okay. In total, in total, probably more than a thousand people have registered all together. Okay. Some of them are just coming for certain talks, though. So it, it's it's kind of hard to know okay. um, how many will come today. But typically, it's been anywhere between a hundred and two and two hundred, and a couple of them were up to two hundred and fifty. But it, this week is going to be a you know, I think people are starting to go on their summer holiday yeah. for the long weekend. So although it is only Monday, we'll see. We'll see how it, how it goes. I have invited uh, some of the downstate high school students through Center for Outreach and some of the contact I have in the Detroit area. So, uh, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. We'll have to ask, um, maybe that can be another question. How many of you so they were in summer outreach this summer? Yeah, so right. I am supposed to do uh, high school in town this summer, but uh, they couldn't come, or well, they're not gonna mm -hmm. come actually. So yeah, usually like, I'm very active outreaching uh, high school students during the summertime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, right. No, this is good because um, I think I think it's really hard to know what an environmental engineer does without <laughs> really going to a talk on it. So I, I think um, I, I hope we do get some prospective students coming here. It should be good. Um, so yeah, our next Monday night one. Let's see if I can figure this out. The next Monday night one. I have to go in there. Actually, I give one next Tuesday, I think. So I've, I've got to get ready for that fast. Is that next Tuesday? Holy cow. Um, oh no, so July 6th, Monday, July 6th. So we do have one next week. So we're mm. not skipping, that's good, I checked. And that one, it should be really interesting because um, we just uh, started a robotics engineering program at Michigan Tech that got approved. And so um, Jeremy Boss is gonna be, um, he'll be talking about kind of what's next after first robotics. And he's, he's, um, he does the uh, um, autonomous vehicle project, which is mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I think it's called the Aurora. What is it called? The, oh, dang it. I gotta look at the words. Um, yeah. So Jeremy Boss will be doing that one. Uh, and he's, he's terrific. I used um, for the Michigan tech, College of Engineering holiday card. I used a LIDAR image taken from um, the autonomous vehicle that the enterprise team has been doing um, during a snowstorm as it was driving itself. I think Jeremy was in the car too, but it was driving itself um, out of the airport area down to, uh, um, oh, where were they going? Um, um, what's the name of that next town, Glenn or uh, Bryant? So if you go out of the airport and take a right, you end up in Calumet, right? Oh, so, um, Calumet. So okay. He mm -hmm. had his whole right. video where it, where, where, um, I mean, you could see the trees and you could see, and yeah. it was snowing heavily, and you could see the lidar screen get obscured by the snow. But uh, so I used a, an image of the, of the lidar image and uh, for the holiday card of the College mm. of Engineering, it was pretty fun. Yeah. So that's what's up next week. So we have um, Jeremy Boss. July 6th, and then um, um, and then me, July 7th. Wait a minute, that can't be next week. July 6th, I'm getting frightened. It is, July 7th is next Tuesday. Yikes, I better get to work. <laughs> so what I'm speaking on next Tuesday night is, um, so three of us, three of the chairs, um, well, you know, there was two, all kinds of summer courses this summer, and we wanted to offer something that didn't cost any money that would be really pretty useful to the undergraduates. So we're offering this course. It's called Tips and Tricks from Three Chairs and a Dean. And so the um, Three Chairs is going to be, Audra is going to give one of them, your chair, the chair mm -hmm. of Civil and Environmental. 
uh, Glenn Archer is going to give another one. He's the chair of, of electrical and computer engineering. And uh, the third one is John Gerke, who was one of our speakers, the first speaker to kick off the series. And so we're going to we're going to really do a high speed briefing of like everything we wish somebody would have um, told us to do before um, we started college, uh, because most of us mm -hmm. had to kind of figure it out along the way. Yeah. So if any of you alumni out there have a tip or a trick you'd like me to share, and I don't want to hear anything about, you know, it's this has to be this has to be clean stuff, things things that mm -hmm. would actually help them academically. Um, so share them in the um, by asking a question about it. That's a good mm -hmm. way for you to share with us. I can see Jeremy's already out there. Jeremy, I was just advertising for you for next week. <laughs> yeah, so. So do you think these uh, Husky bites are really helping to lock in the students to come over, you know, in these very really uncertain circumstances? I have at least one student who emailed me directly saying I put down my deposit today after, mm. after listening. Um, um, so that was, that was very, very nice to hear. And, um, uh, and I don't know if anybody else, if this has made a difference in your life, please send me an email to callahan at mtu.edu. We'd love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And my, um, we've been getting seamstresses in, in the local area. I'm, I'm buying 50 at a time. Uh, so if, if any of our alumni or prospective students would like to have a Michigan Tech um, mask. Okay, yeah. Send me an email. Um, ah. Callahan at mtu.edu with your name and address. And if you have gone to more than one Husky Bites, I will send you one. I might run out instantly because I only have 50 right now, but if you send me your address, I would love to send you one. And if you have a, a second person in your household who also needs one and um, would proudly wear the Michigan Tech um, uh, mask, uh, we will, we will I'll, I'll go open them up and see what they look like. I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> No, they came in the mail today. <laughs> so I promised prizes. I promised prizes for the faithful attendees. So let's see what's in the box. It's from So Irresistible on Sheldon Avenue. And boy, did they actually made them pretty fast. I think I ordered them about 10 days ago. Mm. So oh, they just uh, good. printed the logos on the surface of the mask. Ah. Oh, oh, nicer. Okay, I'm going to have to take <laughs> off something. There you go. They have elastic bands around the ears. And these elastic bands are a little too loose for me. <laughs> oh, that's because I'm putting on two. All right, now I'm going to have to wash that. All right, I think my ears are too small. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think these are made for people with much bigger ears than me. <laughs> so I'll have to like tie a little knot in the elastic or something like that to tighten yeah. them up. So uh, they're pretty cute, huh? Yeah. And they have um, a decent amount of fabric, which is kind of what you want to slow down your ear. And I think it's got a, has it got a pocket? It does, it has a pocket, so you can put your, an extra piece of um, filter in there. I've read that some people are using, um, you know, the high filtration vacuum cleaner bags as a filter. So, so it's good, we've got 30 people already signed on, um, which is awesome. So are you gonna do anything fun this summer, Dasuki? Oh, well, uh... I don't really have any travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you usually, like? Do you yeah, do fishing you, or anything like that? No, uh, no, really. But uh, usually, my family stays in Japan. My kids go to Japanese school in Japan. So in the this summer? is really yeah in summer. So uh, and then I usually leave myself with dog, but. <laughs> this summer, you know, they stay here. So we have a lot of project in the yard, you know, so. I told you, you need to get another dog. 
Ah, so Daisuke he lost his 14 year old dog very <laughs> sadly a couple months ago. So I think um, somebody should pick you up a dog and drop it off at your house. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, now we're a, working on um, building uh, some zip line for kids in the backyard. Oh, good. So, That'll be know, fun. Yeah, first we got to build uh, some kind of, you know, tree house and then, uh -huh. you know, raise some areas so that they can actually yeah. know, go down. Are they going to zip from one tree to another? Yeah. Are you going to put a mattress on the other tree so that when they hit the tree, they, they oh, hit the yeah, mattress? Oh, yeah, let's see. We're not there yet, but uh, <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> One of my friends had something like that. It was a big old smelly mattress, but it, it really, it was better than hitting the tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So, um, yeah, no, I was, uh, we bought a camp um, last fall, and, and so I've been going, driving out on the weekends and spending it's about an hour away out along the way to Point Abbey. And uh, it's much cooler out there. It's very nice. And uh, we have a little screen house that we sit in when the, when the um, black fall eyes are bad. And, uh, but otherwise they're pretty good. It's, it hasn't been too bad. So the chat is working. And, and so Lisa says, very nice masks. Well, and, and uh, yeah, no, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm glad of them. I, one alumnus asked, where can I get the fabric? And so that alumnus, if you're on, just send me your address and I will, I'll get one of these in the mail to you. I might make you sponsor Husky Bites though. So, you know, nothing is really free. <laughs> um, so, um, so I told you about tips and tricks. Um, oh, so the, um, I went, I went fishing with two alumni um, on Saturday. And so one of the alum, alum, alumni is an alumna um, who graduated from Michigan Tech with a mining engineering degree, whose grandfather, whose father, great grandfather, well, whose grandfather and great grandfather worked in the mines and then whose father got a Michigan Tech degree. So she and her brother both got earned um, engineering degrees. Anyway, she's got a really nice boat as you can imagine because she's an engineer and she can afford a nice boat. So she took me out last year and that was the first time I'd ever gone fishing with those lines that you can, you know, press the lever and it goes down to 150 yeah. feet. feet. Um, so we were fishing with, a, with yet another alum, alumnus, a chemical engineering alumnus, uh, Mike. So this is Mike and Terry. And, uh, and so the first thing we reeled in, um, they, they made me reel it in like the newbie. So I'm like reeling it in and reeling it. In. I'm like this, and I'm like, this is really hard. <laughs> this is really hard mm -hmm. to reel this in. And then I was like, oh, come on, just, tough up, you know, don't, don't complain about it being hard. So, but they were seeing me struggle, and, you know, and, and, uh, and so it, when it finally came in, you know, Mike ran and got the net and, and this thing was like, it was half my height. I'll show you a picture oh. in a second. It was a very big, um, very big lake trout. <laughs> uh, biggest one they've, they've seen that year uh, or in a, in a while. So after that we admired it and petted it and stuff, we uh, put it back in, unfortunately. So we didn't oh. have a giant lake trout, but it was big enough that they wanted it to kind of continue to lay eggs or breed and stuff. Mm. So do you want to share your screen, Dasuki? Sure, I will. And show the first slide. We're getting close to on the hour. And so that's your, yeah, that's our homepage. It actually looks like this now. There's no snow. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, do you want to put up the first slide? Oh, this guy, that be. And we have 88 attendees already. And we're getting close to the hour. We've been starting pretty promptly. So I will um, look at my notes. I see some good friends here, Alan, you know, alumni who I, whose names I recognize. It's really nice to see you. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing your first slide yet. I'm seeing your homepage, Daisuke. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so for those of you who are wondering what the, what the weather's like here, it's 88 outside 
and, and 77 inside, which is why I have all the doors and windows shut, <laughs> which seems counterintuitive, but when the wind was hot blowing in, I ran around earlier today and shut all the windows. Um, and uh, it's, it's getting a little steamy in the house, but if I just waited out another 10 minutes, I think that, um, um, there we are. Okay. Very good. All right, well, let's get started. So thank you everyone again for joining us. It's so nice to see you, your names at least. Um, and uh, um, it's been an awesome week um, here at Michigan Tech. We, I'm referring to last week where we went virtually to the American Society of Engineering Education and um, had a good time. Tonight's Husky Bites is sponsored by Noah Mund. Uh, thank you so much. And, and the company Nexus Integrated Solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So if you get dropped for any reason, you can join us on Facebook Live where we are streaming this at on the College of Engineering's website page or you can just click that link. And next slide. So this is to remind me to mention, so if there are prospective students out there, future students, students who are definitely coming this fall or students who are considering, who are still kind of in high school or alumni who just want to like have another evening with me. Um, we are going to start tips and tricks from three chairs and the dean uh, for the four Tuesdays in July. And so I will lead off with um, sharing some tips about things I wish I would have known before starting college, but I figured out pretty quickly. Next slide. So that's my fish. That's not me holding the fish. That's my, that's Terry, who's the fish whisperer. Um, I, I, I managed to fish without actually touching a fish because uh, <laughs> I was using the net and I was reeling them in. And, um, but yeah, that was, they said it was probably about nine pounds. That's a, that's a lake. Oop, 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 I can tell you what it is. So what is it? So you're having the first pole here. You got to tell me. So pretty much people are pretty sure it's a trout. And, and yes, I believe you, you to be right. It sure looks like a trout to me. And uh, so we, we put him back in or her um, so she could make more fish, um, but it was really fun. So biggest fish I have personally ever reeled in. <laughs> All right, so thanks. Um, and so let's go to the next slide. So I'd like to, to now introduce our speaker, which is Dr. Daisuke Minakata. Um, and uh, who is one of the faculty members in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Dr. Minakata is a, an environmental engineer. He earned his BS and master's degree, both at Kyoto University in Japan. Um, all his degrees are in environmental engineering. And then from there, he went on to get his graduate degree, um, uh, his PhD, that is, at Georgia Tech, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. That's why we were talking about it being hot. We're like, this is not hot. Um, <laughs> And after earning his PhD, um, he um, stuck around because he was, his advisor wanted him to stick around, I'm sure, as a research engineer for another three and a half years. And then he joined us here at Michigan Tech in 2013. Uh, and now he is an associate professor, um, very active in research, um, doing research on removing contaminants in water and doing things like looking at um, the fate of, of chemicals, unwanted chemicals in the, in the water and, and kind of what happens with them. Uh, and so I think for our, our next question, I wanted to know who's joining us tonight, Bryant. Do you have time to administer that poll? So we have a poll. So is a future student joining us, a current student or friends of Michigan Tech or faculty or staff or family of current or future students or alumni? And so right now we've got already 121 attendees. Um, and uh, that's, that's terrific for a 4th of July weekend. So we got about, looks like we have about almost half um, alumni again, 6% friends of friends, 3% family of current or future students, which is about three people, 15% Michigan Tech faculty or staff, 5% friends of Michigan Tech. We have 10 current students. Hello, current students. Hang in there. We're coming back to school this fall. And we have 15% or 16 um, what I'm, future students, so students who will join university someday. So thank you, Brian, for administering it. It's always nice to know who's with us. Um, and I know, Daisuke, you, you invited a bunch of high school students. And so I hope some of them are here as a result of your invitation. So um, with, with this, I want to hand it over to you, Daisuke, um, and you can take it from here. Thank you so much for introduction, Janet. Um, can everybody hear me clearly now? Good. OK, so. Uh, 
today, uh, what I'd like to uh, speak about is uh, scrubbing the water, how and then the why. I have done a lot of outreach activities to future high school students and even high school teachers in downstate Michigan. So this uh, kind of, like, you know, outreach activity is a part of that, but uh, I always have some kind of a specific objective. What I like to do at the end of this talk is to stimulate, okay, stimulate your interest in water, any kind of water issues, okay? And then uh, I like to convince you, hey, Michigan Tech Environmental Engineering in School of Engineering is the, actually the nation's one of the leading institutes, okay? So that now you have more interest in environmental engineering, and then you will have more clear understanding of what environmental engineering are really doing here at the Michigan Tech and once they graduate, okay? So let me move to a uh, second slide. So I like to get started uh, with posting one question. So I think question we're having another is, poll here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you trust your tap water? And so the choices are, yes, I do drink it. And the second choice is, no, I do not. I buy bottled water or I filter it or something else. <laughs> well, this is good. People trust their tap water, it looks like. <laughs> so 77% um, drink their tap water and 23% uh, do not. Do you drink your tap water, Daisuke? I, I oh, do Oh, he's drink. waffling. Okay. <laughs> I know too much about the water quality. That's a good question, but uh, I, yeah. I drink tap water, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, now 76%, okay. So, you know, I believe everybody's living in this nation, United States, so yeah. Yeah. So okay. Basically, Very good. okay. Let me close this. So about three quarters of the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always like to ask these questions first, and then you know, let me just give you that just one knowledge. Okay, take home one message: our drinking, uh, our tap water. Okay, it's built in the water infrastructure. It's safe to drink it, actually. So it's regulated by the a lot of regulations by US EPA. Um, if you see this figure, uh, this actually the graph shows total number of the contaminants regulated by the US EPA over years. So in the United States, 1976, this is the year the US EPA was developed, established. And then after that, um, the, over the year, the total number of the contaminants you know, regulated by the regulations increased somehow. So now, 2020, I believe still the same number, but about a total of the 90 chemical or microbial contaminants are regulated by the US EPA, okay? I was born about this, like a really like a left side of the edge, but <laughs> you know, over the 40 years, yeah, it used to be only 20, you know, contaminants regulated, but now 90 compounds, okay? So my question is, you know, do you feel safe because our drinking water is regulated by the regulations? Now about 90 compounds, microbial species, some viruses, microorganisms, and then the majority is you see the green bar, the organic contaminants, mm -hmm. some pesticides or herbicides, those are regulated. But now question is, this is not part of the poll, but I also ask this kind of questions to audience always. How many chemicals do you think we have in this world? <laughs> we mm. use a lot of chemicals, for example. 10 million. <laughs> 10 million, good guess. Okay, so the, you know, first of all, the total number of the chemicals that are registered, okay, so this is not necessarily commercially used or in production, but the total number of the chemicals regulated, 160 million chemicals are, reg uh, are actually registered in the largest chemical abstract service, actually. And then probably 500 to 700,000 of the chemicals are daily use and in production. 
So mm -hmm. now you started being scared because out of 100,000 of the chemicals, only total number of the 90 compounds are regulated by US EPA. Do you feel safe to drink tap water because of the <laughs> fact that? Yes, because, I trust know, <laughs> the environmental engineers. <laughs> Of course, you know, there are so many unknown unknowns, but that's why, you know, environmental engineers need to really do a good job in terms of the water quality engineering, developing some kind of, you know, the, you know, reliable water infrastructure systems to provide safe, portable drinking water. I like to pick one example, a trusting. This is the herbicide. You may want to use this kind of like, you know, herbicide chemicals in your front yard or backyard no, or maybe in some me. agricultural area. <laughs> I dig them all out by hand. <laughs> <laughs> so it is known as a weed killer. Okay, so that, uh, you know, you can actually inhibit some growth of the, some of the weed. But uh, tell you the truth, this atra thing is carcinogenic chemicals. So definitely you don't want to drink the waters that contains above 3 ppb of the atra thing, okay? So that uh, this is a very highly toxic chemicals, but as you see in this map, yeah, Midwest, you know, I don't really see some dots in the Hotong or Upper Peninsula areas, but uh, I still see a lot of dots, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, yeah, this is basically more like agricultural use, but uh, people mm. still use it. And then, you know, eventually what's going to happen is, you know, when you use these kind of chemicals, rain, you know, falls, maybe, you know, the runoff from the land, agricultural runoff that goes to the groundwater, maybe that goes to discharge into the lake or streams, and then they eventually contaminate our environmental waters. Mm -hmm. environmental water as comes back to the water infrastructure infrastructure systems that's why we environmental engineers really need to do a good job to eliminate this kind of potential chemicals okay hazardous chemicals i want you to pay attention to this this atra thing is not regulated yet but it's actually more like you know the potential carcinogenic compound you see three ppb do you know how low this number is? With this, I like to PPB. give you a PPB parts uh -huh. per We get a chance something. to test our mathematical <laughs> knowledge now. So there's three choices on this poll. The question is, what is, what is one part per billion? And so there's three answers, three, quest, three possible answers. One has six zeros, one has nine zeros, and one has 12 zeros. And so one person so far thinks that it's the one with six zeros. And 83% uh, think it's the one with nine zeros. That is one over one, zero, 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 zero. Mm -hmm. And then we have 19 people or 17% who think it's, it's one over um, 12 zeros. All right. And so let's hope that the majority have it right. <laughs> so the answer is yes, one billion is a part per uh, billion. So one zero is uh, uh, nine zeros. Okay, so that uh, second choice is the correct one. But the main message here is, uh, for example, think about that uh, if, we, if atra thing has some kind of a color, okay, so you dilute that atra thing one billion times, would you still see some color? Do you think would you, you would still see some color left? What color is it? Any kind oh. of color. So, you know, oh, I, I usually see. show some kind of like a food dye dilution project, but uh, if you dilute one billion times. I don't know. Yeah, definitely that kind of color would be gone, right? So you won't usually see any more colors. So the point is by appearance, the water looks crystal clean because it doesn't have any color. It doesn't have any brown, yellow colors. It looks really, really clean. However, still like, you know, the, even though you do a good job to eliminate one part per million, for example, but you still don't reach to safety level. So that's why we really need to have somehow advanced 
say biological treatment processes or physical chemical treatment processes to eliminate h racine down mm -hmm. to this one ppb level so that you can drink reliable safe drinking water so that's the point here so yeah, so you may wonder what kind of water treatment technologies you know can achieve the uh, 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 removable and then the down to the three ppb in water. I'm not gonna give you the too much detail, but uh, if you want to know the answers, please come to Michigan Tech. You know we can <laughs> educate you. Okay. So this is the picture of the uh, civil and environmental engineering departmental environmental process simulation lab. Over the years, many faculty members participated in developing this actually the plant scale process controlled simulation lab. This is actually the undergrad teaching lab so that we teach some uh, hands-on lab uh, activities to usually like a junior or senior undergrad students. It's a big areas. We see have some kind of a biological treatment processes. This is kind of a, you know the imitating a wastewater treatment processes. We have reverse osmosis membrane processes. It's a membrane technology. This is a jar testing, coagulation, procuration. This is air stripping tower. It's a very tall tower, but uh, you know we can eliminate a very volatile organic contaminants using uh, this technology. And then the finally, some kind of a caramel test, um, ion exchange or adsorption, carbon adsorption. But the main message here is Michigan Tech undergrad students are actually educated in this hands-on lab uh, uh, laboratory, and then the, they actually develop their own skills, and then the, they learn how reliable water infrastructure systems can remove uh, potential chemical contaminants down to actually the safe drinking water levels. I also like to emphasize that if you go to the many, many universities in the United States, unfortunately, you won't see that this kind of a very nice process simulation that are in many places. That's why Michigan Tech uh, undergrad environmental engineering program is actually ranked very high because of this uh, unique opportunities we provide to the students, okay? So well, if you have a chance to true. come to campus, please let me or Janet knows, and I'm happy to show you around. I'm happy to give you some kind of a tour, okay? So it's, it's gonna be really, really fun, okay? Let's move to a little bit more, actually, you know, future things. Okay, so our future. I like to share some kind of, you know, the information about what's going to happen in the future about the water. Everybody is really concerned about the contaminations, some virus, bacteria contaminations in water. So let me just give you some ideas here. So oh, I like to give poll. you some poll, yeah, questions. So, the, so I'm, I'm reading the questions because when people um, see this later on, they, they won't necessarily see the, um, the poll. So the question is, would you drink treated wastewater if you had no other choices? Yes, I would if I had to. No, I would not because it sounds unacceptable. Oh man, no, like we, we're at almost 100%. Yes, I would if I had to. Oh. <laughs> treated wastewater. This is water with poop in it. That's what that means, wastewater. I mean, other things besides poop, but right? Wastewater is detergent from your washing machine. You know, it's got soap in it. It's got food particles in it. It's got, what else does it have in it? Cleaning oh. supplies, <laughs> cleaning chemicals. Anything, anything. So, Pesticides. Yeah. All right, 90, mm. I changed some of their minds. I think I changed some of their <laughs> minds at the end. So it's 91% said yes, I would if I had to. And 9% and say no, mm -mm, no way. <laughs> Yeah, this is very interesting because uh, this is actually one of my favorite questions I always ask. And, you know, it depends on where you live. Maybe, you know, if you live in California, you don't really have a choice. Everybody is aware of water scarcity issues. But I believe 
you know, the, in uh, Michigan or Midwest around the Great Lakes regions, but uh, still like 90% of the people actually are acceptable to drink uh, treated tap water, uh, tre uh, treated wastewater. Okay, so we're starting to get some questions coming in on the chat, but if you could instead ask them on the Q and A, um, I will I will be able to you know we'll be able to answer those questions at the end. But the one that came in on the chat that um, I'm afraid we'll forget. So we have a question from Michael: Is bottled water significantly cleaner than say Detroit municipal water? Yeah, uh, very good questions. Um, I can't really say yes and then no, but I like to give you the fact that tap water, say in Detroit, tap water regulated by, as I show, about 90 uh, chemicals or microbial standards, okay? Tap water, the total number of the contaminants regulated, probably 20 or 30. You mean bottled water? Uh, I'm sorry, the bottle of the water. Yeah. So this will probably give you some idea. So that the basically it's a regulation is a different. Okay. So for mm. the tap water, municipal tap water, or you know, commercially available, the dasari or some bottle of the water, you know. So it's a regulation is different. Very okay. interesting. Yeah. So. Uh, All right. Back you... to you. <laughs> okay. It's a very good question. This is a little bit complicated slide, but I'm going to make it very simple. Okay, so if you see the water treatment plant, okay, here, and then this is actually where we live municipal, industrial, agriculture, agricultural use. So we live here in city or, you know, some towns or some village here. So our water is, you know, usually like, you know, the coming from the, the drinking water treatment plant. And then what they do is actually they take for example, groundwater or surface water here, and then as a water resource, and then that they treat that, they do a good job, and then they distribute the portable water to the uh, public people here. And then the, once we consume the drinking water, okay, in the household, and then the, this actually comes up to uh, the wastewater treatment plant. So at this moment, you know, suppose everything goes to the wastewater treatment plant, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the wastewater treatment plant receives even like, you know, industrial waste or agriculture, maybe, you know, how HRC might be included, but uh, everything goes there. And then uh, usually wastewater treatment plant is by using biological activities, they treat, they do a good job again, but uh, they discharge the treated wastewater into environmental waters, like, like a surface water or groundwater. Okay, so that the natural environment, you know, we don't want to contaminate natural environment so that uh, we have some regulations and then, you know, we have to make sure that wastewater treatment plant really need to do a good job. But uh, this is the future, okay? What's gonna happen is instead of discharging the treated waste waters into the, uh, the environment, because there might still, you know, some concern about, you know, some residue of the chemicals or maybe some pathogen virus, okay? So instead of doing that, actually that we built a new infrastructure systems by actually engineers wastewater reclamation plant, which is actually located between the wastewater treatment plant and the water treatment plant. So what's happening is, is you see some kind of a very nice loop, okay, starting from a water treatment plant, we consume it, discharge it to the wastewater treatment plant, and then we further purify the treated wastewater, and then they send it back to the water treatment plant, or sometimes, you know, send it back to the public people directory, so which is called the direct portable reuse. So it's actually, you know, people start drinking a treated wastewater directory from the engineered infrastructure systems. Of course, in order to do this one, you know, we engineer, you know, municipal, uh, the municipalities really need to do a very good job, but, uh, you know, this kind of a closed loop Okay, sustainable cross the loop is really, really the way, sustainable way to actually move forward with this, um, the water cycles. And some people call the, this is the, actually the concept of the one water. So we no longer distinguish, 
or differentiate tap water or waste water or reclaimed water. It's just only always water is recycling, okay? And then the, we just engineer the systems really do a good job here. So that in this case, you know, we don't need to worry about the contaminating uh, environment such as the river or lakes or groundwaters. Um, so that's the kind of part of the futures. Some of the waste areas, you know, it's already happening. If you look at the internationally, Singapore, probably everybody's aware of that very tiny island of Singapore. They actually do this kind of a direct portable reuse. 40% of the treated waste water is actually goes back to the tap water. Okay, directly. that's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah, so this is kind of like a future. I'm not really sure, like, you know, around the Great Lakes regions, we have abundance of the water, but, uh, you know, main point is we don't want to contaminate the environment, okay? We need to protect ecological systems, okay? Even like mm -hmm. people's recreational use. So this is actually sustainable way to use the waters, okay? No, that's impressive. So, you know, speaking of the water reuse, this is the uh, ultimate systems, okay? So why water treatment at the Michigan Tech? Here is actually the one of the answers you like to actually find it. So you see the pictures. This is the actually the international space stations, okay? A lot of activities going on at the stations, but uh, you may wonder how astronauts survive over the couple of months staying at the international space stations without rivers or lakes or, mm -hmm. you know, they don't really have any water resources. So the answer I think I can is, guess the answer to this. <laughs> so this is our future. So, you know, at the international space stations, you know, they have technologies, they develop the and then actually the Michigan Tech environmental engineers, my previous generations of the faculty members actually redesigned this water treatment systems at the International Space Stations. And then actually they design, they recycle the waters. It's 100% water recycling. You know, even wow. like astronauts do activ activities, um, do some exercise, their sweat, or even like, you know, some uh, moisture, even their pee. The breathing, okay. yeah. Yeah, anything related to the water actually captured it. And then it goes into these systems and then that they further treat using some advanced technology I show in the process lab, okay? And then actually they drink it and then they take a shower using this reclaimed wastewater, okay? Mm. And then that, that water is recirculating at the stations. Nice. Oh, so, uh, yeah. So if we were on the space station, we'd be drinking our recycled pee. <laughs> and, we'd, and it would be okay because it's, 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 a, it's a very robust system. And then the astronauts, you know, come back to the Earth healthy. <laughs> so, yeah, they, yeah. Yeah. So that this is was, you know, part of the very interesting, actually, the project funded by the NASA, okay? Um, well, and so yeah. our students were designing that system. Yes. That's pretty cool. Was that, and was that part of an enterprise? Oh, no, that's very serious. A, a research senior project? Yeah, it's okay. a senior, research, yeah. research project. This is my final uh, the PowerPoint slide. So I just wanted to um, introduce my research group. Um, these are the, some nice pictures. You know, I'm really, really proud of my students. Okay, they, I have a very diverse uh, the students groups. I always hire uh, work with undergrad researchers as well. Okay, there are some grad mm -hmm. students, of course, but uh, I pay attention to actually the diversity and then actually the, you know, different types of the students here. We do some advanced oxidation reductions for emerging contaminants. I show some chemical contaminations. Some of you may be aware of the PFAS issues, polyfluorinated chemicals. Mm -hmm. In the state of the Michigan, yeah, Michigan is leading a very, you know, the top for these issues. But uh, now we have a lot of issues, you know, amid the COVID-19, but 
people shouldn't forget about the PFAS. You know, this is a very, very important issue. Yes, my group also doing some research for the PFAS, developing some advanced treatment technologies for the PFAS, mm -hmm. for the water reuse applications, membrane technologies, and also in order to protect the natural aquatic environment, you know, we study some of the chemicals or fate of the chemicals or nitrogen containing a contaminants. And then also we do some sustainability related issues, water, energy, food, nexus issues. So it's really like a triggered by the one water concept, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, uh, here at the Michigan Tech in environmental engineering, in the College of Engineering, um, yes, we do a lot of actually the things for water. Okay. And that's your son in the lower right, I think? Yes, here. <laughs> Very good. And that's your lab in the upper right? Yes. Is that your research lab? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. This is your last slide then? Yes. All right. So, um, would you... I would encourage people to start typing your questions in the Q&A and um, Daisuke has promised to stay to answer all of your water related questions. Mm -hmm. um, and any other question you might have about about environmental engineering or the department. Um, I would like to once again thank Noah Munt and Nexus Integrated Solutions for sponsoring um, this Husky Bites webinar. Thank you so much. All proceeds, 100% of them, go, are going to fall 2020 student scholarships. Um, we have a lot of students in need as a result of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and so every, every penny will be used in support of students. Our next session, we were mentioning that earlier. Um, so Jeremy Boss is going to be talking about what's next after FIRST Robotics. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit about the autonomous vehicle and the um, competitive team that they put together. Uh, here at Michigan Tech. I, I do want to mention um, we have a new robotics engineering program. A Bachelor of Science in Robotics Engineering is available uh, here at Michigan Tech, which is, which is just wonderful. And there are other related um, deg degrees as well. I, um, there's also a BS in mechatronics that will be available. Um, I wanted to say one more thing. What was it? Um, oh, so enter your Q&As. Yes, please um, um, yeah, just go to the next slide. I think it's the end now. So it, yes, it's time for Q&A. And um, so you've already answered the question about bottled water. And so I'm going to pull up the Q&A. All right. And so we're going to take um, a question uh, or a comment really from Walter, um, who mentions that in South Africa, a lot of the water available is recycled water. So one water, um, which is very, very interesting. Uh, one of our uh, alumnus uh, uh, asks, uh, is bottled water quality regulated in the U.S. by the FDA? And, and you started to answer that earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the answer is yes. But not as many chemicals are monitored. Correct. Which is kind of interesting to me. Uh, and then also the standard regulation for the same contaminants, but, uh, you know, the level is different. So is the level higher for bottled water? It depends, but uh, usually tap water has much more strict actually regulations. Oh, fascinating. Oops, yeah. there goes my cell phone. Sorry, I have to turn off my cell phone. There we go. Um, Michael asks, what classes do you suggest high school students take to prepare for environmental engineering programs in college? Chemistry 101, Biology 101. Yeah, I still use chemistry, uh, high school chemistry uh, to teach my uh, water treatment principle design class. So yes, it's a chemistry is very, very important. And also biology, high school chemistry, biology, that help a lot. Yep. And keep rolling your math along. That's the other thing that you end up needing, needing to. So a question from um, the Geiger family. My water has potassium permanganate and soda ash in it. I am afraid to drink it. I drink bottled water. What are, what are these ingredients added to water? Why, why, I guess, why, do they, why is potassium permanganate and soda ash added to water. Yeah, that's uh, probably more naturally occurring uh, groundwater. I believe that water is originally coming from the groundwater. So groundwater mm -hmm. tends to contain a little bit high 
uh, potassium and permanganate. Okay, so it's very common. So uh, it's not just in because of the industrial, you know, the uh, discharge to the ground, but the more like a naturally occurring uh, uh, those uh, constituents. Okay, so there are some um, uh, point of use or point of entry type uh, uh, equipment you could use to eliminate those, you know, part of the kind of filtration systems. Okay, yeah. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Um, and so how do municipalities decide on what to filter or are there state or national guidelines that are followed? So who sets the local guidelines? Local guideline is, uh, for the case of the Michigan, Michigan DEQ uh, actually has its own kind of like regulations, but uh, I think in the nationwide drinking water standard, it's really like a US EPA is really in charge of that and you know what kind of credit they can give to the municipal water treatment systems. It's actually the US EPA's job. So, okay. Yeah. Or so we have a question, how effective are residential RO units in mm. purifying water? Uh, it is very effective. Okay. What's an RO um, unit? It's a reverse osmosis unit. So, ah. uh, right. Um, technically, like a reverse osmosis is supposed to eliminate any kind of contaminants, okay? Uh, so it is reliable, but the question is, you know, how often you have to replace with the uh, old, you know, the membrane systems. Um, our role is not really like a cheap technology so that, you know, you don't want to change the membrane or, you know, the cartilage, say, every week. So you <laughs> definitely, you want that to last a couple of months at least or years. So, you know, that's actually, you know, you have to ask about the cost as well. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it is very effective. It's a reliable system. All right, so we have a question. Is tap water safe for cancer patients or is distilled water safer? Oh. Yeah, I that's wish a, kind I knew of a medical because question. Yeah. <laughs> my father passed away because of the stomach cancer when he was just 48 years old, I wish I knew <laughs> oh, the answer, boy. but uh, you know, it's not because of the water, of course, but you know, there are so many actually, you know, factors affecting the issues. Um, but he's actually, the question was comparing the tap water versus distilled water, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. distilled water, it probably won't really make a huge difference uh, in terms of the water quality for cancer patient. That's I can tell, yeah. Okay. Pat, my next door neighbor says, thank you to Daisuke. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the question next is from John. Water treatment systems and water distribution systems are among the largest and often the largest consumers of electricity. Are, are there re Michigan Tech water research projects seeking technology improvements to reduce energy demands? Mm -hmm. In the nationwide, water infrastructure consumes four to five percent of the national energy consumption. Wow. Yeah, so it is definitely not negligible. It's up to you, you know, as a really significant number. I, I think it is. Uh, that's just, you know, distribution systems. I mean, the water infrastructure. But uh, if you think about even like your food you eat, Okay, mm -hmm. or even like anything, you know, even your car, in order to manufacture some of the machines, engineer the systems, you need water. Even medications, you need water, purified water. So it's actual water usage for any kind of product we use in our life, it would be much, much huge. So, yeah. Interesting. All right, the next question is from Luca. Uh, are the students in your research group all environmental engineers or do they differ? Do they come from different fields? Yeah, very good questions. Uh, uh, I would say no, it's mixture. So uh, I'm really good at actually recruiting a students from a different <laughs> department or from different areas. Some actually from a chemistry background, some actually has more like a computer science background. 
okay? But, uh, you know, our objective is always, you know, environmental engineer, water engineering related issues, but the tool are actually different. So sometimes I use a computational tool, I use a chemistry tool, physics tool, mathematical tools, so that uh, I really need to have a diverse, actually, the student who have a different background, so. Very good. What PPB, what level of PPB is allowed for PFAS in drinking water? Yeah, PFAS, Michigan <laughs> set so up small. actually, it's not PPB, it's actually PPT for PFAS. It's oh. a trillion parts per trillion. And then the state of the Michigan just set uh, 70 PPT, but the which is still not sufficient so that they are actually thinking to go down actually the maybe four or five PPT. Wow. So yeah, it's pretty dangerous stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty so oh very interesting. All right, this is a this is a question from a future student. What is the best kind of engineering major for studying and solving water problems? Environmental engineering, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I could answer that one. This question's from Leonard. Is it safe to drink my well water? Or more importantly, what advice do you have for testing my well water? Yeah, well water. Uh, the question is more like a private, private, private well yeah, water. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's more publicly owned. Yeah, yeah. you better definitely test um, just a major like water constituents. Okay, if you are really worried about lead or some like, you know, the metals, yeah, you know, you probably better check, it. okay. But unfortunately, private wells is not really regulated, okay, by the regulations. So it's actually the, it's uh, more like, you know, the uh, household responsibility. So yeah, it's your responsibility to actually, you know, measure and then the check the water quality. So I would test it once it once a year, Leonard, <laughs> just to make sure it's still good. Michael asks, what 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 water filter system do you suggest for a person on a well system? So that's a related question. Mm -hmm. So if you have a well, um, so is this an artesian well or or a uh, or a sort of uh, well? He won't, he won't be able to answer me because. Um, mm -hmm. But why don't you assume it's it's not an artesian well? Yeah, if you like to use a filtration systems, first you need to eliminate some of the particles. Uh, you can't really see it, but uh, it's you know colloidal particles. So microfiltration uh, followed by microfiltration or ultra filtration. Okay, they do a good job to remove some of the particles. If you like to remove more like a pathogens. Uh, you have to probably use a nano filtration systems. And also some actually mentioned like a reverse osmosis, you know, you can use it, but uh, make <laughs> sure like, uh, you know, micro filtration, ultra filtration first. Okay, so that's uh, important. I would get it tested and if it needed to be all those filters, you could, you know, then do it. <laughs> <laughs> I did, my first house that I tried to buy here though, um, they did, um, you know, we had a well, the well tested and it was, um, it had E. coli. It mm. had E. coli in the well, and, and then mm. they flashed it, and then they, you know, we retested it uh, the very next day, and it was still had E. coli, and then mm. they flashed it again and tested it again, and then I said, no, 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 all done, not buying your house. <laughs> I want to be able to drink my water. Mm. Um, all right, so this question is from Tom. Um, Hi, Daisuke. Are there any issues with using the sludge from wastewater treatment plants after processing with regards to things like viruses and any parts per trillion of drug solids. So this, this person sounds like an expert. Yeah. Um, Is this one of your former students? <laughs> no, maybe, maybe not. But uh, yeah, first of all, I'm not an uh, expert on the pathogen, but uh, uh, I think, you know, he's mentioning a uh, uh, biosolid. So, uh, usually, like, you know, the biosolid also has uh, one or two classifications, you know, biosolid A or biosolid B, and then the biosolid A can be recycled, but, uh, yeah, biosolid A has much more strict regulations, so, but, uh, 
you know, those are the actually the things, you know, we really need to study. So, you know, for example, PFAS in biosolid, okay, or some pathogens in the biosolid, yeah. So some of Michigan Tech uh, environmental engineering faculty members actually do uh, some uh, biosolid study. So, um, and then uh, they are looking at monitoring uh, some pathogens, actually mm -hmm. viruses mm -hmm. or pathogens. Okay. And then uh, they try to actually, you know, uh, regenerate more, you know, recycled biosolid for some commercial use. Okay. So that, uh, yeah, there are some studies going on, but uh, that's a very good question. Yeah, we don't really know yet. And the next question is from Brenda. How long does it take for wastewater to be processed to the point where it becomes safe to drink? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the, once the water goes, uh, wastewater goes into the uh, municipal uh, treatment plant, it takes about uh, less than definitely half a day, okay? And then, the, you know, they discharge into the environment, okay? But, uh, it's not really like a time, okay? Time doesn't really matter, okay? You know, it's just really like a quality of the waters, okay? So, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit difficult to answer, you know, the time scale, but uh, yeah. So you can really spend weeks to treat the waste of water, right? So, yeah. Mm, okay. All right, this is a question from, um, from Jim. I live in a home with my own ground well. Mm -hmm. This Jim is on our advisory board. I have a whole house particulate filter and a carbon filter in the refrigerator for making ice and drinking water. Should I consider additional filtration? And if so, what would that be? Yeah, so carbon-based filtration systems, uh, again, do a very good job but uh, probably some of the chemicals may permeate through that. Or if you still complain about uh, some kind of a taste, okay, or some odor, okay, uh, I can actually like, you know, smell some of the tap water. It's not just because of the chlorine, but I can still smell or, you know, or taste some of the very tiny you know, chemical constituent, but you may want to add like I mentioned, like, you know, the micro uh, nano filtration system or a reverse osmosis, you know, cartilage after the uh, mm -hmm. carbon filter filtration systems so that uh, uh, just, you know, you could actually add another barrier, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to make sure that you need to replace that kind of filtration system, the cartilage, uh, you know, at a safer level, you know. I don't know how frequent you have to, but, uh, Sometimes, you know, people use uh, filtration systems for a long time without replacing the cartilage. That will actually cause more issues, okay? So... Yeah. Like in, 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 in my refrigerator where I just keep ignoring the fact that it's, it's run out of filters. <laughs> yeah, you better replace it. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, this refrigerator, I decided I didn't want that feature anymore. <laughs> um, all right, so Merle asks, um, I've, I live in a rural area and I have a well. Do chemicals we put on our lawns make it down to our well inlets? Mine is 200 feet deep. Yeah. I say just grow weeds mm. and mow them. That's what I do. Mm. I think they're pretty weeds. <laughs> yeah. You with, have to answer this though, Desi. Yeah, with this information, it's a little bit difficult to, to say it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. No, I was uh, I was I, like the queen of the crabgrass this spring because if you if you can get the crabgrass out, they live over winter. But if you can dig up all the crabgrass by hand, you're all set for the next year. <laughs> yeah. So chemicals more like you know some are uh, nutrition, maybe. What kind of a chemical? Oh, like fertilizer. Yeah. Yeah. Fertilizer. It depends upon whether it's a yeah an herbicide. All right, so if it's an herbicide, is that more, is that more likely to go down? Yeah, well, it's probably environmentally, it might be very stable in water, okay, so that, uh, yeah. But usually, like, you know, those, like, water-soluble chemicals, you know, yeah, they can be eliminated uh, relatively, uh, in relative uh, time frame, so that, uh, 
and then even like a 200 feet down, yeah, maybe you don't really need to too much worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there arsenic in Houghton water? I heard that there was once mm. from another Michigan Tech geological engineering alumnus. All right, we're gonna have the we're gonna have the actual answer now. Is there arsenic in Houghton water? Yeah, I'm not aware of that. Uh, so it's not multicellular level. So uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the next question is from Thomas. In the water reclamation portion of the process you mentioned, how are you able to remove the widely variable medications and associate residual compounds that are released from households before treated, waste, well, treated wastewater is consumable? So this is how do you get the medicine out of the water? Those are the technologies I've been studying in the research labs for 15 years. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe almost like a 20 years. So advanced oxidation reduction technologies. Okay, so uh, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, it's really like advanced physical chemical uh, treatment systems. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but uh, I like to mention, we never ever rely on one water treatment technology to remove everything. Okay, maybe some of the technologies can remove too long, remove up to 99%, but, you know, engineer the system always fail, okay, so that uh, we need to have some resiliences, okay, backups, so that uh, we rely always on multi barrier concept. So not only just one technology, but we always combine different technologies, oxidation, membrane, okay, mm -hmm. and then the eventually disinfection, and then uh, this oxidation and the membrane technologies, actually, you know, we, we have a confidence actually in removing uh, those pharmaceuticals or some of the medications from the water. Very good. All right, we have um, 16 open questions, 19 answered questions. And I want to, because I know it's coming up on the hour, I, first I wanna thank all people for coming here. Um, uh, it's awesome to visit with you every, every Monday evening. I've been really enjoying it and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. And we're gonna stick around and answer all the questions. Daisuke promised to stay. And so we'll see, it keeps, more and more questions keep opening. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> all Should right, I... this question's from Noah. Mm -hmm. Are the energy implications to utilizing reclaimed water mm. uh, in the one water paradigm being investigated related to applicability to energy efficiency programs and carbon reduction goals? Yeah. Yeah, a simple answer is yes, definitely. <laughs> and then the, those like, you know, the energy consumption, it's a comparable to conventional systems. Okay, so that uh, it's actually accepted. So you're not gonna see one day water bill would be 10 times as expensive as it used to be. No, it's not gonna happen, even though you decide to go to the reclaim the wastewater systems. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. your water bill won't really change significantly. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, the next question is from um, Gary. Is the zero water filtration system effective in removing contaminants in water? Oh, uh, do you know I'm about the system? The zero water filtration. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard of it either. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's okay. We don't know. John asks, he says, you showed chemical product used for agriculture products and corn was 86 plus percent. Uh, and so corn for animal consumption or for human consumption? Any difference in effect between the two? So I guess the question is, are they using chemical product for human, human corn that will, be, that will be consumed by humans? Or are they using the chemical product for corn that is used by um, animals? I, I don't oh. think I know the answer. Oh, I guess uh, I don't know. Okay, so I'm a little bit confused about the corn versus uh, food versus animal use. Yeah, yeah. They're probably using it for well. It, it'll. I imagine they're using it for just simply corn, but that's just speculation. All right, we have a question from Joan. What kinds of jobs do en environmental engineers do? She knows the answer. John Chadden. <laughs> <laughs> well, she wanted me to say it, actually. That's why she was yes. asking these questions. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. good question, John. 
um, <laughs> environmental engineers to job? Yeah, this is a good question for the future students. Yeah, so um, many undergraduates actually work at, uh, say, a consulting company, environmental engineering a consulting company, and then actually they make a lot of good money. Yeah, consulting business, manufacturer, um, because they have more like, you know, the bachelor degree. So um, uh, I think uh, the consulting company is uh, probably a major one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and so um, I'm putting my Dean hat on now. So you always want whoever is out there, a future student, make sure that whatever university you plan to attend is a life, you know, is ABET accredited because in order to do consulting, you have to be a licensed professional engineer, which means mm -hmm. go to a good enough school where they prepare you well enough to pass the fundamentals of engineering exam. Then you work for a period of years and then you take the, a second exam. And now you are a licensed professional engineer, which, and they give you a stamp and you, you stamp your work, your work, you know, your work, uh, and you are able to testify in court and, and all kinds of things. Um, but it really, it, the beginning of that is going to the right kind of university and getting the right kind of education. Um, so the next question is from one of our future students, William, do you know if BPA, and I don't think I know what that is, has been removed from bottled water bottles? Yeah, good question, bisphenol A, so BPA. It's not just, you know, coming from the water itself. It probably comes from like, you know, the plastic bottle materials. Okay. Yeah. But uh, usually like, you know, you may see the sign BPA free plastic these days. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you know, uh, even like, you know, the yeah, plastic materials, you know, these days there are so many products that have BPA free. Okay. So right. you may want to choose that kind of a product. Yeah, throw definitely. away all your old drinking bottles. They stopped <laughs> doing that about five years ago, right? Isn't it about, probably about yeah. five years? Yeah, I remember at one point um, gathering up all the old nasty um, water bottles we had <laughs> and shade and just making sure I, we bought some. Um, so this question's from John, who is one of our alumni, I believe, I'm pretty sure. Scattered drinking water sources in the Western UP have been found to contain uranium in amounts that exceed the federal maximum containment level of 0.03 milligrams per liter. Are uh, reverse osmosis systems capable of removing uranium from Western UP camp wells, like those on Abbey Peninsula? Ooh, I didn't know there was uranium out there. Mm. Yeah, probably, uh, yes. Okay, uranium, mm -hmm. yeah, probably yes, yeah. Okay, good mm -hmm. to know. There, people are going to be buying a lot of re reverse osmosis filters, I think, <laughs> after this talk. Nicole comments that it is hotter in Houghton than Honolulu, and then, and then goes on to ask, has anything been published on your work with PFAS? We're working on it. Uh, my students gave a presentation at the conference. Um, yeah, we're working on the, some uh, publications. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this next question is from one of the Geigers. Will it be hard for environmental engineers to get jobs during the pandemic? Mm. Um. So I, I'm, mm. I'm gonna jump in here and speculate, um, no, because environmental engineers are in constant need um, because it's, it's, you know, um, I, th I would speculate that the predominance of environmental engineers are working for municipalities and they have to make sure that they keep our, our water going, right? And so I, I would speculate that, that, that it's not like, you know, petroleum engineering or something like that where all of a sudden the demand has dropped. We're, we, there is a, de a constant and steady demand for water, but I don't know what you have to add to that, Daisuke. Hi, and even I also like to mention, I got, so busier in this pandemic situations. So that means I have more things to do. I think environmental engineers are really like, you know, that need to show some kind of a good leadership, 
We are concerned about the COVID-19 presence in water, in wastewater, and the people already detected, identify it. That might be a good way to actually, you know, uh, expect, you know, second wave or third wave because those like, you know, the virus stays in wastewater and, you know, researchers identify it. So that's more like, you know, the uh, some kind of, like, you know, the uh, notice actually, you know, that people, you know, more and more people get infected from there. So, uh, and then even like a student's level, um, yeah, it depends on the students, but uh, I, I communicate with many undergraduates and uh, they actually had a job, but uh, I never heard they even like, you know, their, their job uh, being canceled. Okay, so mm -hmm. they actually accepted their offers and, you know, many actually undergrad actually took that or took that jobs without any issues. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. That's very yeah. interesting. This next question is um, from Peter. While three parts per billion may be considered safe for atrazine, mm -hmm. I understand that PPT level measurement is possible. Is PPT level resolution reliable? If so, is it helpful in guiding policy and setting standards? And then how often are the effects of prescription drug disposal entering the water stream being monitored, monitored and mitigated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, yeah, PPB level uh, detections, uh, quantifications of those chemicals, uh, even in the very nasty wastewater, but it is definitely possible. And then, of course, you know, the Michigan Tech Environmental Engineering or even College of Engineering have a lot of advanced analytical equipment, and those are available. Uh, so, uh, yes, it is possible. Okay. Um, PPT level resolution reliable. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, you know, the evolution of the computer, but also analytical equipment, you know, every year it's actually the advanced uh those like you know the sensitivities uh detection resolutions a mm -hmm. lot so um yeah we have technologies um how are the effect of the prescription drug disposal oh yeah <laughs> yeah this is a good point um my message is please do not dump uh your all the medications into your toilet systems Okay, wastewater treatment plant at this moment, they are not responsible for removing those old medications from wastewater treatment plant. Okay, so we are not really sure they can do a really good job or not. So that's not the, really the so idea. So what, sh what should they, if you need to dispose of them, how should you dispose of them? Yeah, so a lot of like, you know, the pharmacies, even like we have Walgreens or Walmart, they have some programs to adapt or to actually accept all the medications. So, you know, please make sure you, you know, you put it back to the stores so that they can actually professionally, you know, appropriately dispose it. Okay. Very so good. There are some programs there, definitely. Very good. All right, and so a, a, a question from Phil, how much of the Great Lakes water is currently being used for drinking water? Mm. I'd like to know the answer. I don't know, yeah, good question. There's yeah. so much of the Great Lakes. I would say less, I'm gonna guess, less than 1%. Because <laughs> it's, it's such a vast, reservoir. Mm -hmm. I'm actually still in shock by how much water there is here because I moved here two years ago from Boise, Idaho, where there's there's like there are are narrow rivers and that's the only natural water body. Uh, and the and the river flow is only from from snow melt. And that's it. And and you know it, it's amazing how much water there is here. It's just shockingly abundant, you know, and beautiful. It's our our treasure. All right, what is the most worrisome contaminant that you want to remove from municipal water supplies? Yeah. Well, at this In moment, our area, maybe. Yeah, oh, this, our area. Yeah, I'm not concerned about our, you know, drinking water systems in Hotong or Hancock or UP. So, yeah, so like, you know, some uh, mining industries, you know, there are always some uh, 
contaminations, PCB or mercury or some lead or copper, but uh, uh, in the municipal drinking water treatment, actually that we provide or they provide municipal systems, they provide a reliable water. So yeah, as far as I know. Not worried here. What about if you were in Detroit? Oh, uh, it's a different story, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I frequently hear some spike of the industrial chemicals detected. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, so I don't drink tap water announcement from the some local government so that they have to boil it. Yeah, so yeah, it depends on the regions, but uh, yeah, all the industries actually still there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm a little bit worried about some presence of the chemicals there too. Very good. Well, in this question, I think you already answered, should we worry about COVID-19 getting into water systems um, or do environmental you know, systems remove viruses? Well, and so your, your project, is this one of the ones that the College of Engineering seed grants mm -hmm. is supporting? Mm -hmm. And so you're get, just getting started establishing baseline values, mm -hmm. right? So um, would you want to just brief that project that you're working on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, right, so we really, seriously concerned about the presence of those COVID-19. Um, uh, overall, probably uh, it depends on the water you take, but the wastewater system is probably there, they should be there, okay? But uh, uh, for example, like current drinking water technology disinfection using a chlorination or UV uh, disinfection, they work very well. So they can mm -hmm. actually inactivate COVID-19 much more quickly and effectively. So, you know, so that uh, in terms of the drinking water, I'm not too much worried about the presence of the COVID-19. But in terms of the waste water, uh, yes, you know, there are some concerns so that we are actually trying to actually understand, you know, you know, the presence of those, you know, COVID and then how we can really address the presence of those COVID-19 viruses. Yeah. Very good. So um, we're going to take one more question. Uh, how many students work in your lab at any given time and how many semesters do they get to work there? And I'm going to add a little bit to that. Um, how, how many do you employ um, undergraduate students uh, to do research in your lab? Undergrad, yes, I do. Um, they go back and forth, but uh, I don't usually, this is really like, you know, my philosophy. I don't hire undergrad students for just a monotonous job. You know, they may do just a data inputting or some kind of, you know, the helping a grad students. Sometimes, you know, they do, okay, they work with grad students, but uh, they always have their own project. They have their own, uh, research issues or themes, and then the, they work as a team members. So numbers, it depends, but uh, so yeah, that's the reasons. I don't have many undergrad researchers, okay, but each undergrad actually um, work more like independently, okay, like almost like a grad student, mm -hmm. okay, and then the, once they work, they stay at least one year, two years, and then Good thing is 80, 90% of undergrad researchers go to grad school at Michigan. <laughs> that's your secret trick. Yeah. I know, that's what you're recruiting them. <laughs> well, and, and uh, one of the because things that like we have- Michigan Tech. Well, we, at right. Michigan Tech, we have the accelerated masters where you can, six of, two of your undergraduate courses can count toward the 30 credits you need for your masters. And so it, it really, it gets you 20% of the way already into your master's degree. All right, so since I said that was the last question, two more questions popped up, both from Peter. Both from Peter. Um, so um, I guess let's take the first one first. Does the unique and pervasive nature of the water molecule make it easier or more difficult to discriminate from the vast array of contaminants, um, making high quality, thereby making high quality treatment possible? Uh. So I would think because water is a lovely polar molecule, it makes it a little bit easier, but I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an environmental engineer. Yeah, it depends on definitely the contaminants. If contaminants are like a polar compound, you know, they stay with the water so that, you know, you can probably easily eliminate it. 
if the contaminants is not like you know the polar compounds so hydro hydrophobic compound mm -hmm. uh it makes it a little bit difficult but we have technologies mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so that uh, depending on the physical chemical properties i always you know this is why we really need to understand first of all what's in water okay and then the second of all you know what kind of characteristics do they have once we know there and then you know we can actually use some available technology to remove it so it really depends yeah very good all right and then one more question from peter mm -hmm. does the michigan tech um, environmental engineering program study and model groundwater migration of contaminants mm. um there was a faculty members who did this kind of like a, a groundwater uh more like you know probably fate of the contaminants in groundwater right yeah and then the, maybe janet knows alex may uh, used to do this kind that's of uh, right, that's right. modeling in groundwater yeah one of our professor emeritus mm -hmm. yeah. all right and we do have one more question left which is um about microplastics and so microplastics they used they used to sell makeup which had little kind of grit in it and you could clean your face with these mm -hmm. microplastics but it turned out to be a really bad problem so the question is can microplastics be removed from wastewater yeah good question uh, many researchers are actually still doing a lot of research actually in microplastic fate of the microplastics in different water infrastructure systems mm -hmm. as far as i know I look at the, some data in uh, publications. Uh, majority of the plastics actually are removed by the wastewater treatment systems. Yeah, that's good. But that's now good. they go to sludge, maybe solely biosolids. So maybe transferred to some other stuff, so that. Uh, but they're still there. Yeah. Well, and if these things eventually end up in the water and the fishy, you know, it, it kind of ends up accumulating in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the bio cycle. So the, all right, we're at the end of your questions. It's 7, 12 PM and we've still got 41 attendees um, listening and um, enjoying our webinar. And so um, uh, Daisuke, Dr. Minakata, thank you so much. Uh, it's thank been so an much. honor to learn things with you. And uh, really, really appreciate learning what environmental engineers do and, and hanging out with you tonight. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll Thank see you, you next so week. We're going to learn a little bit about what's next after FIRST Robotics, uh, and we're um, looking forward to that. Good night. Good night. Thank you.